Hey there, molecular genetics friends. So, I have my coffee. I've been looking at DNA sequence for a while this afternoon, this morning, whatever. Um, and I've got some ideas. And we'll see where we go. So, um, one of the ways I think that it's useful to take this class on is to think a little bit about the history of both um, genetics from a molecular perspective, but as much uh, the history of the technology of molecular biology. You know, exactly what is the technology we use to be able to ask these kinds of questions and to be able to develop experiments in molecular genetics. And we're going to spend some time, uh, this first bit, week or two, um, going over some of the sort of old-fashioned ways we carry out molecular genetics and then being able to think about that in modern terms. Things like, uh, you know, these days we don't really use isotopes anymore, radioactive label, uh, at least not here at all, and that used to be the standard way of labeling up DNA is using radioactive phosphorus, P32. And uh, we'll look at some of the technologies and how they have changed and the kinds of uh, modern approaches to some of these experimental issues, things like gene cloning and looking at uh, genomes and things. So uh, some of you know I've been kind of kicking around this idea of uh, looking at vitamin C biosynthesis in some of Dr. Wilcoxon's birds. It's a really interesting story in that vitamin C biosynthesis is dependent on a single gene in that there are biochemical pathways or there's a biochemical pathway that uh, all eukaryotes have and it's a single branch point and a single enzyme that shifts and makes ascorbic acid. And there is a bit of metabolic cost to it because you do generate some uh, oxidizers and things. but. Uh, we don't have a functional gene. Now we have the gene, but it actually has got mutations in it. And I think most of the mutations end up at splice, exon and tron splice boundaries. So my kind of brainwave I had, uh, I think over the weekend, was one of the things you have to do is rather than looking at the RNA, which is not necessarily something you can do if the gene's not being expressed, uh, looking at the genomic region. And the genomic region spans about uh, 12,000 nucleotides, about 12 kb, in the chicken. And I figure chickens, they're birds, there you go. And when you start looking at it, there's actually 12 different exons. And they're uh, kind of clustered. There's uh, oh, about five or so here, and then seven here, and there's about an 8 kb, 7 kb, chunk in between, a really long intron, and I just had this flash that we're going to amplify up this side, sequence it, amplify up this side, sequence it, and it's going to give us actually some really good uh, spots to start thinking about PCR primers and developing PCR-based experiments, and potentially even some sequence analysis. And at the same time, I will uh, force you to do some of the legwork for Patrick Smith's senior seminar. There you go. Uh, yeah, we'll see where this takes us. Um, we'll also be doing some different kind of cloning strategies and things as well. But for today, I thought what we'd do is go over some of um, the basics that are essentially in Chapter 1 um, and then get into Chapter 2, which is really the fundamentals of um, the history and then the evidence and ways we approach the notion that genes are in fact made of DNA. So, um, let's start from the beginning, shall we? Why not? Uh, one of the things I often think about uh, as a molecular biologist, traditional Mendelian genetics really becomes somewhat irrelevant, and particularly the, this era now of uh, inexpensive genome sequencing. You know, rather than having to do various test crosses and all these genetic problems that you've had in genetics, uh, you take the organism, you take a few cells, and you sequence it. That's how you do genetics. So the notion of dominance versus recessive uh, are old-fashioned quaint terms that now in the era of genomics and frankly in the era of molecular and cell biology that we understand how proteins work, the idea of 
a dominant gene or a recessive gene are quaint terms. They refer to a gain of function and nucleotide changes or a non-functional gene or a non-functional protein. And so we can be a bit more sophisticated in how we think about these genetic terms. So I have to say that you know the notion of doing um, Punnett squares and things, I'm like, oh man, no. You just sequence it. Just don't even bother. That said, it's worth knowing these kinds of things. And so we're going to think a little bit about the historical perspectives and then work our way from there. So let's think back. Think back? Let's think back. A uh, hundred years ago, in fact, it's probably close on to really a hundred years ago, in which the uh, notion of inheritance has been established. Mendel's work has been uh, rediscovered. Uh, but one of the things that was not known was what was the material that was the actual genetic material. So at the turn of the 20th century, people were beginning to do a fair amount of enzyme work. Michaelis and Minton were doing enzyme kinetics at this point. Um, Krebs has been doing all kinds of work elucidating the metabolic pathways of his cycle. And so one of the things I think uh, flavors this early foray into this kind of, you know, the mechanism of inheritance was the fact that we knew a lot about proteins, but not much about uh, nucleic acids. And so if you were to ask your friendly neighborhood um, biologist of say 1910, what their best thought would be for inheritable material, they would probably say, oh, it's public proteins. Because when you look at nucleic acids, they really don't have the ability to form interesting structures that we know that proteins do, and the structure is critical for their function. They, at a naive look, seem to be not that much more interesting than, say, cellulose. And so a pretty good notion would be, well, nucleic acids are probably the scaffolding that are holding proteins. And then somehow these proteins are being moved around from one cell to another or during gametogenesis and things. And that's how we're actually able to transmit genetic information. It's on these proteins. You know, sorry, so how the protein is being generated, well, we don't know. But the idea is that prior to... Um, Thomas Morgan, really, in the discovery of the chromosomal basis of inheritance, people really didn't know how genetic information was being transferred. And so, first term, uh, we have T.H. Morgan to thank for what he phrases as the chromosomal basis of inheritance. Because Mendelian genetics has established that we've got these different kinds of traits that can be tracked and we have dominance and recessiveness, but exactly uh, what is moving these things around isn't known. Now, Morgan at Caltech, um, probably around 1910, 1920, he began studying fruit flies. And it really was a uh, fortuitous point that he began to look at flies. Flies have got a number of tremendous advantages in terms of being used as a model genetic system. And you may or may not know, my PhD is in Drosophila cell biology and developmental biology. My postdoc was completely in uh, Drosophila developmental embryology and carrying out mutagenesis screens. And near the end of the semester, we'll be getting into some Drosophila genetics and looking at Drosophila developmental genetics. And it's a really wonderful story. So it is something that I am really keen on in terms, and I, you know, as part of just understanding what it was I was doing and what my research organism was, I have looked into the history of how this thing comes about. So Morgan began working on flies and what he began doing is accumulating different kinds of mutations. And from this, he began establishing some basic rules. Now, a couple of things that Morgan had, uh, or that, that flies were able to provide as a tool. Uh, one specific notion is that flies have what are known as 
polyteen chromosomes. And we'll look at some later as we're getting into some genomics and things. But a polyteen chromosome is a chromosome that undergoes round after round of DNA replication, but not actually going through nuclear division. And so the chromosomes replicate right on top of themselves, and you get literally a thousand copies of the chromosome stacked up. And it actually becomes so large that you can see the chromosome, not quite with the naked eye, although um, when you know what you're looking for, you can begin to see the polytonized cells, because they're really, really big. But um, under the microscope, you can actually begin to see these chromosomes. Now, not all parts of the fly larva undergo polytony in the same way. Uh, as it just turns out, that in advanced eukaryotes, we don't typically have polytonized chromosomes. Uh, we don't, but flies do. And the salivary glands are a really good spot. They actually polytonize really well. And you can do something called a chromosome spread, where you essentially pull apart a uh, fly larva, take the salivary glands, and initially it looks just like you know hash, but once you know what you're looking for, there are these little cucumber-shaped objects, and you can pull them out, dump them in a little bit of acetic acid to begin to actually precipitate the proteins, place them on a microscope slide, and then using a, um, I like to use a number two pencil eraser, and start tapping, pop, 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 on a cover slip. And then you begin to spread out the nuclear material, the chromosomes. And what you end up with is something that looks a little bit like this. Sort of an idealized thing. There you have a, a chromocenter, and then you've got these chromosomes that are laying out like this. And they look, uh, particularly when you're starting to squash them, they look a little bit like one of those sorts of uh, springs in a sock, like you know the joke of you know the can of peanuts that you pop open and the snake uh, jumps out. That's what they look like. In that they actually have a three dimensionality to them of being rather round, and then you flatten them down. And when you do this, you can begin to see that there are parts of the chromosome that are actually fairly dark and parts of the chromosome that are light. And these are referred to as bands and interbands. And the banding pattern, actually we now know, is a result of portions of the chromosome that are not being expressed. That is, um, there are portions of the chromosome that have unwound, and this is where gene expression is occurring. And then there are other portions of the chromosome that remain fairly tightly condensed, and they have a dark, more condensed appearance, and the areas around them tend to have a bit more of an opened up appearance. And another one of the things that flies are known for is they've got what are known as puffs. These are areas that actually uh, poof out. And these puffs are sites of a whole lot of gene expression. That is, the DNA opens up, and this actually became the uh, hallmark of some really important um, information in back in the 60s or so, uh, mid-60s, for the mechanism of how steroids work, in that steroid um, treatment of chromosomes can cause puffs, and we'll get into this later. But the main point is the banding pattern is invariant within a species. So within the species Melanogaster, the banding pattern of the chromosomes is in fact always the same. And so you can, with a bit of care, learn to read the chromosomes and identify the individual chromosomes. And I've got a CRC book over in the lab that is the maps of Drosophila chromosomes. And it is just a whole bunch of micrographs of the different areas and the different bands. And so one of the things that Morgan and his student Bridges began doing was cataloging and categorizing the bands and actually developed a nomenclature for them. And if you sit there and stare at them long enough, you can begin to recognize, ah, that's chromosome one, that's chromosome two, that's X. And this, the way the fly genome is set up, um, X is a short chromosome and chromosome 2 and 3 actually end up um, 
spanning this chromocenter, and so you had the, what's referred to as the left arm of chromosome 2 and the right arm of chromosome 2, the left arm of chromosome 3 and the right arm of chromosome 3. And what they began doing was begin uh, numbering and ordering the chromosome up from position 1 all the way out to position 100 on chromosome um, 3L. And this allowed them to begin looking at the chromosomes and identifying different kinds of spots. And one of the things that Morgan was able to do was develop mutations in which there was a chromosome abnormality, is essentially a, a banding pattern change, that he was able to associate with a specific mutation. And he could demonstrate that that banding pattern was being maintained along with that trait. Now, one of the things they were using back then was uh, one of the classic fly mutations, which produces a white eye. And it's one of the things in fly nomenclature that's a little bit different than other organisms, is that the mutations are typically, or genes are typically named for the mutation they cause. And so the white gene, when it's functioning, actually gives red eyes. And, of course, he didn't know that, but, you know, because you have this mutation and it causes white eyes. And so what do you do? You call that the white gene. And so we have the white gene. And generally, that's the way the fly mutations have been named, is that the gene name reflects the effect of removing it, not what it does. But Morgan was able to identify a change in the morphology of the chromosome associated with the inheritance of white and what he was able to demonstrate was that chromosomes were part of this inheritance procedure. Now, still at this point, the idea of DNA being the hereditary material was not something that would be easy to grasp. It was still probably assumed, all right, the chromosomes are serving as a scaffolding to hold individual proteins and then they're being transmitted sexually and the proteins are having their effects and we don't know how proteins are replicated, but there you go. So we have the chromosomal basis of inheritance, early 20th century. So we got to move forward actually to around the time of uh, World War II, a little bit after, in the 40s. We start to have the very first experiments that are really getting to the point that DNA is, in fact, the information. That it's not just the chromosomes are the structural carrying thing, but that nucleic acids actually are the information. And the really good experiment that brought that about is... one that we actually discussed in uh, molecular cell a bit. And that is the idea of Oswald Avery and the transforming principle. So let's go through some of his experiments a bit. So Avery and McLeod, but Avery gets the bulk of the credit. Avery began looking at um, a specific form of um, a pneumococcal bacteria that would generate bacterial pneumonia. And he identified two different strains of this bacterium. One that they called the S strain, and S being uh, the smooth strain. And what it is is that it actually has the peptidoglycan candy coating that is in fact the toxic part of the bacteria. And they had identified another strain that they called the R strain. And the R strain is wrinkly and rough because it's lacking part of the peptidoglycan uh, candy coating and it is non-pathogenic. So what they found is that if you inject the S strain into mice, you give the mice pneumonia, and you end up with a dead mouse. If you inject the rough strain, you now have a mouse that walks away, a happy mouse. All right, so what Avery began playing around with was cracking open the S bacteria, 
and mixing it with the R bacteria and seeing if he could figure out what was it in the S strains that was in fact pathogenic and could it be passed on to the R strain. So, you know, the specifics of the experiment I'm not sure if they're really all that well known. They probably are in some paper. Uh, you have to treat the R strain with specific chemicals. Primarily, you have to treat them with calcium chloride, which allows the R strain to take up material. And you then crack open the S, and you can carry out what he calls, because they had observed this, this idea of what's known as transformation. So transformation is the ability of taking material from the lethal S strain and putting it into the R strain, and the idea being that you're taking the R strain and transforming it into a lethal S strain. So what he wants to know is what is the transforming element or the transforming principle. What is it? So back in the 40s, the standard thing you would do is begin fractionating the material in the organism and you have on hand a variety of reasonably pure enzymes that you can begin doing this with. So you crack open the S bacteria and you would then take this solution, mix it with the R bacteria to demonstrate that yes, it can transform the R into a lethal strain. So that's your control. Now you take that same mix and first you treat it with enzymes that will break down proteins, what we call proteases. So you proteolytically degrade all the proteins and you expect, given what people are thinking, okay, that's probably going to block the transformation because it's the proteins that's doing stuff. Lo and behold, proteases don't touch the transforming element. So the transforming element is not a protein. The next thing you would do is put in various kinds of glycosidases and then lipases. You want to start degrading sequentially every single biomolecule. And then you would take an RNase and break apart all the RNA. And of course we know it still transforms, but when you take DNA and you break down all of the DNA, transformation can't occur. And so what Avery was able to discover, Eureka, and that is this. DNA is the transforming element. So, we go from Morgan recognizing the chromosomal basis of inheritance to now with Avery recognizing that we absolutely have the transforming element being DNA. This is a fairly significant experiment. Now, after World War II, the ability to develop radioactive isotopes comes about and this allows for other more elaborate experiments that Avery and McLeod began to carry out and one of the better ones was taking a bacteriophage that are able to infect bacteria and labeling them with two different isotopes. You put P32 into the bacteriophage mix that gets incorporated into the phosphate of the DNA, and then you put in uh, typically a radioactive sulfur labeled methionine, S35 methionine, and that's going to be incorporated into the amino acid polymers. And it's a fairly easy thing to do. So we've got these two different isotopes. We'll see how our red is doing. We've got. Ooh, can you see that? No, you can't see that. Let's see if I have a better marker. I'm trying all my different markers here. We got radioactive phosphorus, P32, labeling up DNA, 
And then we've got radioactive sulfur labeling up a variety of all the different proteins. So now we'll be talking about bacteria viruses later in the semester in some detail actually. What bacteria viruses do is infect a bacterium and they cause uh, the bacteria to lice and you end up with this little plaque. So they put the bacteria uh, phage in with the bacteria, the virus in with the bacteria. They let them sit for a few moments and then they put it into a blender and whiz the whole thing up to knock the bacteriophage off. And they look to see what the bacteria had in terms of radioactive label. So, not surprisingly, it turns out that the S35 protein stays on the surface of the bacterium and it's the P32 DNA that's getting inside. And so once again, we now have even more evidence that P32 or DNA is in fact the information, not just the carrier, but the information for genetic inheritance. So some pretty good experiments going on here to demonstrate that which we now accept is that DNA is the inherited molecule. All right. Now, uh, in the 50s, of course, Watson and Crick, along with um, a variety of other people, began to develop the model of DNA. And a lot of work is going on, some of it actually um, occurring at the University of Illinois down the street, in which they were beginning to really start looking very carefully at this DNA molecule. And the notion uh, of it being double-stranded begins to come about um, fairly quickly. There is the Mieselson and Stahl experiment in which they use a heavy isotope and they're able to demonstrate that as bacteria replicate, you end up with initially a strand or a double strand DNA molecule that doesn't have any isotope. You've got DNA that has one strand with the heavy isotope and one strand doesn't. And then if you let that go long enough, you end up with both strands having the heavy isotope. And they're able to differentiate them using a uh, centrifugal um, gradient of different, either sucrose or cesium chloride is a standard one. And so they had the idea of what's known as semi-conservative replication. So it's got to be double-stranded. Shargoff and his colleagues that may have actually been at U of I, they began looking at the base composition, and we developed what is known as Shargoff's rules. And so, by the early 50s, we know the composition of DNA. We've got the adenine, and we've got guanine. These, are, of course, are the purines, and then we have thymine and cytosine. These are the pyrimidines. And what Shargoff was able to recognize is that the amount of A within a DNA mix equals the amount of T. And the amount of G is equivalent to the amount of C. Now I draw the C uh, with three lines because this stuff is hydrogen bonded and AT base pairs have two hydrogen bonds, GC base pairs have three. So it takes a while for um, X-ray crystallography and various models and designs to come up with the fact that we eventually end up with a double helix. So, you know, if I had my way back machine, my time machine, you could go back in time and whisper to Watson and Crick, the bases go on the inside, uh, you would be able to share the Nobel Prize. Because certainly, the only difference in DNA and the only way it can carry information is through the bases because the sugar phosphate link is homogeneous. The information or the variety is going to be in these nucleotide bases. And an idea would be the bases would be facing the outside 
Where's my camera? And that way, systems can kind of feel along the edge and recognize what the bases are and begin generating RNA. Um, the notion that they would be on the inside was not something that was immediately obvious, but once they began working with the models and things, it starts to come about. And using X-ray crystallography, we begin to develop the notion of what we call the double helix. So I like to think of the double helix from a variety of different perspectives, but one obvious sort of way is to take a, an aluminum ladder and twist it, and that is gonna be a double helix, where the rungs of the ladder are in fact the hydrogen bonds between the individual nucleotide and, and the base pairs. So this begins to establish the overall structure. Now, as the investigations continue, we begin to recognize the actual structure of DNA. And one thing I think, you know, in biochemistry, you gotta memorize all the structures. Hey, go for it, whatever. Uh, at some point, I did memorize the structures of adenine, guanine, cysteine, thymine. Memorized it, took the test at 10 in the morning, and by lunch, I forgot it. If you wanna memorize the structure of the bases, hey, go for it, I'll be proud, put on a t-shirt, I don't care. What we do need to know though is the fundamentals that are required for our discussion of orientation and uh, DNA topology. So this is the level of structure we need to know. We've got the ribose sugar cyclized with the oxygen up there at the top. And we've got a carbon here that we don't want to forget about, but you know how these uh, line structures are. And we've got then the nitrogen containing base, ATGC. All right, so now the critical parts are the following. A ribose five carbon sugar is going to have hydroxyls at both spots here. And there's a hydroxyl up here that nobody cares about. Um, we have the O link here. And then you got the base. So the base is numbered with one through whatever. Uh, the sugar is using the primes. So we got the one prime carbon the two prime carbon, three prime carbon, four prime, and then finally up here, the five prime carbon. This is really critical because this is how we begin talking about the orientation of DNA, is we've got the five prime end and the three prime end. Now, just as a little point, uh, this hydroxyl is critical for beginning to link up nucleotides because we're gonna take a nucleotide triphosphate, there's the base, here is the triphosphate, what's the phosphate link there, and we're going to pull one of the uh, two of the phosphates off and link up the phosphate with this hydroxyl. So I'm not trying to draw this in its complete accuracy, but there you go. So we got the O, 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 O. This is known as the phosphodiester link. And it depends on having a phosphate up here, what we call in the biz, the five prime phosphate. So we'll write that there, the five prime phosphate. And you have to have an OH group here, what is referred to as a three prime hydroxyl. So we have the 5 prime phosphate and the 3 prime hydroxyl. Now, what that means is 
this guy really isn't involved in linking up nucleotides. The two prime hydroxyl, neither here nor there. If we've got the two prime hydroxyl, we have ribose sugar. If the two prime hydroxyl has been removed and we just have a hydrogen, it has been a deoxygenated ribose sugar. And so we've got ribose and deoxyribose. Now, just as a little note, and we start getting into DNA sequencing, you can uh, chemically generate a nucleotide that is missing this one. This is known now as a di deoxy. And a dideoxy, typically abbreviated as a DD RNA, um, or a DDNA, yes, little d, big DNA. A dideoxy nucleotide is not able to allow for anybody to come up behind it and link to it. It's referred to as a chain terminator because if you incorporate a dideoxy into your polymer, nobody else can come along behind it because you've got to have the free. 3' prime hydroxyl to be able to link up another nucleotide. And dideoxynucleotides are actually a really critical tool. Um, dideoxynucleotides are used as a primary therapy for retrovirals. Uh, HIV is treated with a dideoxynucleotide. Uh, the reverse transcriptase that takes the RNA and converts it into DNA, which is part of re uh, the retroviral, retroviral life cycle, is um, able to take up dideoxys at a much higher frequency than the standard RNA polymerase. And so um, you can end up putting dideoxys in and block viral replication and not have too much of an effect on the rest of the organism. Dideoxys are also a critical way for doing uh, standard DNA sequencing, known as Sanger sequencing. We'll be getting into DNA sequencing technology in a bit. All right, so that's our basic nomenclature. Now, when we begin thinking about DNA and RNA and the orientations of these molecules, um, we typically dispense with the diagrams and have a much more simplistic cartoon. And it's one of the things I would caution you if you're ever drawing DNA. Don't try to mimic the double helix unless you have some specific reason for needing this helical structure. We draw it as a box. Thank you very much. So, if we were to diagram DNA, this is the critical way to think about it. And it is like this. So, for those of us in Molecan Cell last semester, <laughs> we stopped right about at this point, like the best part of the class, thank you very much, but this is how we think about um, diagramming a double-stranded DNA molecule, is we've got the five prime end, meaning there's a five prime phosphate here, and just a simple doggone line, don't get no fancy with it. And we denote this as the three prime end, the three prime hydroxyl. Now, the bottom strand is running in the, in the exact opposite direction, such that we've got the five prime end here and the three prime end here. Now, if I were to turn the camera upside down or turn the board upside down, you got five prime, three prime. So one of the things to start thinking about when we're looking at DNA sequence is DNA sequence can be read from two different directions. It's either five prime to three prime that way or five prime to three prime that way. Now, when you're given a DNA sequence, just as an example, um, the DNA sequence A, A, G, G, T, T, C, C. And sure, actually, whatever. Uh, it is always customary we read from left to right, and if you're doing this in um, Chinese, I'm afraid you probably end up doing it in English because 
that's just how it's done. And this is the five prime end. This is the three prime end. And we can then fill in, using Chargaff's rules, the opposite strand, or the complementary strand. That is going to be T, T, C, C, A, A, G, G. But we know this strand is running 5 prime to 3 prime. So we could flip this around and write this 5 prime to 3 prime and have the sequence going the other direction. Just flip it upside down. Now, most of the time when we're looking at DNA sequence information, uh, the bottom strand is simply inferred. We don't give you the bottom strand. When nobody gives you, tells you what that is, it's not worth it. Look, here's the top strand. You know what the bottom strand will be. So DNA sequence is always presented as just a single strand molecule and the bottom strand is assumed. Now, um, in the last few moments for today's lecture, uh, one of the critical things to think about with DNA and RNA to a degree, but DNA particularly, is we can split the double strands. How do we do it? Glad you asked. By heating the DNA and basically just bring it to a boil. That will cause double-stranded DNA to become single-stranded. So, if we boil up DNA, we go from double-stranded DNA to single-stranded DNA. And this is referred to as denaturation. Now, if you remember from molecular cell, we go on about the ability to denature proteins quite a bit. Um, that is, to remove the secondary and tertiary structure. Many proteins, once they've been denatured, cannot renature. They are permanently denatured. Fortunately, with DNA, we can renature it. And when we do, we go from single-stranded DNA and it can renature, also known as re-annealing or reassociation. And we actually, as we get further into genomics, we'll be looking at some reassociation kinetics, and there's some very cool information that can be obtained from this, where you take DNA, double-stranded DNA, boil it up, and then allow it to renature. What we're allowing is for base pairing to occur. Now, we have some terms that come about from some of the uh, biochemistry of this. If you take DNA, and put it in a UV spec. Double-stranded UV, double stranded DNA absorbs UV light at a very characteristic wavelength and at a characteristic ratio. As it denatures, single-stranded DNA absorbs UV light at a slightly different ratio and a slightly different absorbance. And so by doing a UV 260 analysis, you can distinguish between double-stranded DNA and single-stranded DNA. And what people can do is, um, and I'm not sure if we have one in the building, but you have a cuvette in your UV spec that is heated. It's a water jacketed cuvette. You put your DNA in there and you slowly begin cranking up the temperature and watching the UV absorbance. And you're gonna come to a spot at which you'll get a change in the UV absorbance. And that is the melting point. Now. This is actually a useful term, and it is known as the melting temperature, or the TM. This is 
the temperature at which 50% of the DNA has been denatured. It is basically the melting point. Now, TM is a really critical number when we start manipulating DNA because at the TM, that's where the double-strand DNA is becoming single-stranded. And there are things that actually can manipulate and change the TM, specifically uh, the base composition. So this is sort of a list of things that affect TM. And GC is going to have a higher TM than AT. So things that are GC rich have a higher TM than things that are AT rich. Consequently, if you want to pull apart DNA, look for an AT stretch. It's easier to pull apart thermodynamically. Now, this is going to be strictly uh, involve the DNA sequence. You can't manipulate that because the DNA sequence is what the DNA sequence is. There are also some other factors that are going to play into TM that we might be able to manipulate. And it is blah, 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 this. The salt concentration is going to affect TM. And that has to do with the stability of the hydrogen bonds in the double strand DNA. And high salt results in a higher TM if you take the same DNA and you put it in a low salt buffer, like um, with high salt being like. Uh, 500 millimolar, half molar sodium chloride, low salt being maybe 10 millimolar. Uh, low salt is going to dramatically. Wait, I'm screwing this up. High salt. Thank you. Fine. If I had the ability to edit my videos, I would chop this out, but I don't. You're seeing it live, baby. This is it. All right. Um, high salt is going to stabilize the TM. Maybe I did have it. And we then have the melting point is going to be equivalently a higher TM. Low salt is going to equivalently lower the TM. Yeah. All right. Now, this has something to do particularly when we begin looking at DNA hybrids that aren't exact matches and it, like this. We can carry out a renaturation and allow for base pair mismatch. And this is the last thing that can affect TM. Now, if we've got a perfect base pair match, then the TM is going to be whatever it is. But if we've got base pair mismatch, that's going to reduce the TM. It's going to make it easier for it to melt apart. So base pair mismatch is going to in effect, lower the TM. So, uh, this is really important for cloning because we might identify a gene, say, from chickens, and now we want to identify the corresponding gene in a bald eagle. They're pretty closely related, but they probably aren't going to be identical. And what we can do is carry out a reassociation, but carry it out at a lower TM. And in terms of interacting and carrying out these kinds of hybridization, 
This is referred to as stringency. That is the degree of base pair mismatch. Now, we can have a screening or a hybridization that is of a low stringency. And that will allow for a higher degree of base pair mismatch. Now, if you want to write it down, you can write the opposite. A high stringency is going to require a lower degree of base pair mismatch. We have to have identical sequence. So, we'll see as we start getting into this. This is really useful when we begin thinking about uh, mutations and things, trying to identify single nucleotide changes. Because if you've got a stretch of 100 nucleotides and you're trying to identify a mutation within that, it might be a single nucleotide difference. You can carry out a hybridization in which you're able to identify uh, and wash off the hybrids that are uh, not identical and maintain those that are identical. Or the other uh, way of thinking of this is you can have reduced stringency, which will allow for base pair mismatch. So that gets us going. I got all kinds of ideas now. And uh, we'll pick back up on um, Thursday. And I'm going to start thinking about how we're going to begin doing some in vitro labs. So uh, rock on. I'm still thinking about my sign off. I don't have my sign off yet. This is Dr. G. I'm out. Eh, I'm not working on it. Anyway, cheers, folks.